today I'm going to introduce you to Rusty CodeGen GCC, which is a GCC CodeGen for the Rust compiler. Uh, this talk will uh, present you the progress of this project, uh, what is already implemented, what still needs to be done, um, and what we could improve uh, both in the GCC side and the Rust side to make this project even better. And finally, we'll talk about the potential issues uh, we might encounter in the future for the different use cases that you might want to use this project for. So um, the Rust compiler currently is based on LLVM, uh, which means it does not support all the architectures that are supported by GCC. Uh, however, it provides an API to have a different code gen, and that's what it's used, uh, for instance, with uh, CraneLift, which is a uh, backend written in Rust. So the way it works is that you can load a dynamic library uh, for this code gen, and that's what this project is doing. It leverages uh, libgccjit, which is plugged to the Rust compiler uh, as a standard library. Uh, and currently, there is a pull request for inclusion in the Rust compiler itself that is in review. At the bottom of uh, the slides, you can see uh, the link to this project. Uh, it was uh, moved to the Rust Lang organization recently, so the link does change. So why do we need this project? Well, the Rust language is becoming more and more popular, uh, and we might want to use it on some other architectures that are not supported by LLVM. Uh, and there are some projects like uh, the Rust for Linux project and Firefox and librsvg that, might, that you might want to run on those architectures that are currently not supported in Rust. And of course, the embedded programming community might enjoy having to use uh, this code gen for supporting other architectures. So the state of the project right now is that it's implementing, it's, it has implemented a lot of stuff and can run uh, programs using a standard library in Rust. So you can do like all kinds of operations like meta operations, memory operations, like load and store and the reference. Uh, it supports uh, global variables, constants, functions, and the uh, lower level concept of basic blocks. It, also supports uh, atomics and thread local storage variables. Uh, it supports inline assembly to some extent. Uh, there still need some work there to support it 100%. Uh, it supports many intrinsics and also the embedding of metadata in object files, which is used by the Rust compiler. For instance, when it wants to load a procedural macros, it will read some metadata there to know some stuff about it. Uh, you can set the optimization level uh, to GCC uh, to have like an optimized build. And currently, it's supported in Godbolt, the Compiler Explorer. So you can already try this project uh, without having to compile both GCC and uh, this project to use it. So that's pretty cool. So uh, currently, it pass all the libcore tests and most of the UI tests. Uh, the UI tests are uh, tests that will use the Rust compiler to compile some code and check that the STD out and STDR matches. So we're fairly done supporting all of those uh, use case used by those tests. Since the goal of this project was to run Rust on new architectures, I made an experiment to run a Rust program on M68K, which is an architecture that wasn't supported at the time. Uh, but now there's a pull request to add the support to it since it was added to LLVM. So it's still early stages. Like I had to do some hacks to make it work, like uh, disabling 128-bit integers uh, and stuff like that. Um, but it proves that it's possible to actually run Rust code on platforms not supported by LLVM. So in that case, I ran a simple Hello World program uh, in QMU on the M68K architecture. Uh, I tried running the libcore test, uh, but it crashed at runtime, seemingly because um, I could not use 
I could not tell the Rust compiler to use the M68 K architecture because it it's not support. It wasn't supported yet, and so I, I use a different one, which was MIPS, which was close enough to make it work. But uh, some traits like libc probably had different values for between MIPS and M68 K, and there will be some other traits to fix as well in order to make this work. So what needs to be done? There are some attributes like inline that is not supported yet. Uh, the debug info, no debug info is currently limited, so I will need to add that later. In some cases, there is some bad code generation, like code that will just seg fault while it should not. Uh, and even sometimes it will just crash uh, libgcc JIT. Also, as I mentioned earlier, some platforms does not support 120-bit uh, integers in GCC, and um, we might want to also use non-power of two integers uh, because the Rust compiler sometimes emits such kind of integers. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we'll need to add the support for new architectures in uh, some crates like libc and object, and also in the Rust compiler itself. Um, after that, we'll need to add the support for link time optimization and SIMD, which is single instruction multiple data for vectorizing instruction. And also, we need to add a support for unwinding to support panics. So there is a question in the notes. For the bad code generation cases, do you plan to add new tests to the Rust test suite as you detect such cases? Uh, yeah, uh, I will do that if uh, needed. Uh, like currently, some tests does don't pass, so maybe those tests actually cut the, those issues. But if uh, it turns out that there are no tests for those use cases, I will of course add new tests to the Rust compiler test suite. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the inline assembly support is not completed yet. Uh, the main uh, thing that needs to be done is to support our GCC constraint code. That will uh, require also adding the support for new architectures in the inline assembly uh, syntax for Rust. Um, also, I use a workaround to initialize global variables because currently in libgcc JIT, there was not a good way to do it. So that's uh, uh, something I'm currently working on fixing. Also, um, the Rust compiler needs to check uh, in the uh, back end what are the features that are supported, like some SIMD stuff. Also, uh, for some integer operations, uh, you can get what is called a Posen value. Uh, I'm not sure if GCC has a concept for that. Um, so that's something we'll need to check. Also, there are some uh, things like alignment and some flags like volatile that needs to be handled. Uh, I, it's handled in most cases, I'd say, but uh, in there, there's a few missing cases. And also, I need to add a support for packed tr structures. So uh, there are things that need to be improved both on the uh, Rust compiler side and the libgcc JIT side to uh, either make this project more convenient and use less hacks, but also in some cases it will be necessary to actually implement the features because it's currently not possible. So in the Rust API is very closely related to the LLVM API. So Sometimes you get an innovation that does not actually exist in GCC. So one thing that uh, is bothering me for this project is that in LLVM, you have a concept of value which uh, contains both R values and L values, but also functions. But in libgcc JIT, you have R values and L values. So to actually make use of this Rust API, I, ha I had to use unsafe cast and stuff like that. And uh, that would be great to actually fix the API to avoid those. Uh, and the, the same for functions. Also, to implement panics, uh, the, in the LLVM code gen, they use the lower level of uh, concept of landing pads. 
while in libgcc JIT, they use uh, try catch. So to support unwinding, we'll have to fix the Rust API so that we can support both approaches. Also, the handling of basic blocks is mostly implicit in, uh, when I use the Rust API. And it's something causing issues like uh, in some cases, I had to implement some intrinsics because the GCC didn't have the equivalent to what is used in LLVM. Uh, so for some of them, there were jams uh, which required adding new basic blocks, and I needed to tell uh, the Rust compiler that I actually changed uh, to a new basic block where it didn't expect that it will happen. Also, one fundamental issue uh, that is in this project is that the libgcc JIT intermediate representation, which is GIMPL, is AST based, while the LLVM represent, uh, representation is instruction based. So in some cases, I had some weird issues, like for a the reference of a pointer, I was like just doing the the reference operation in GCC, and since it was not actually added to the current basic block, it will end up in another basic block, uh, which might actually dereference the pointer after a drop, for instance, which will lead to a, a sec fold. So I'm not sure what we could do here to improve that. Uh, but yeah, that would be great. And also, in LLVM, they support operations and aggregate types like structs and array and vectors, while in libgcc JIT, they are like different types with different uh, operations. So if we could like actually divide that in the Rust CPI that will be uh, simpler in my case. On the libgccjt side, um, I'd like to improve the type introspection uh, because sometimes uh, you want to know if a type is a, an integer, for instance. But currently, if I have an integer type with some attributes like aligned, cannot like actually compare it to know if it's, it's that integer type because there's an attribute in it, so they are not equal. So uh, improving that will help me in some cases. Also, uh, currently, I, I haven't done much test about that, but it seems the compilation time is much lower than with the LLVM backend. Also, in some cases, uh, there are optimizations that are not done with this uh, GCC code gen while they are done in LLVM. So uh, we'll have to fix those issues. Uh, if you try this code gen and notice such missed optimizations, please open an issue that will be really helpful. And also, the binary size of the generated executable seems much bigger than with the LLVM code gen. So that's something else I'll have to investigate in order to fix. So in order to make this work, I had to do a lot of patches to libgcc JIT. Uh, one of them has been merged yet. Uh, the others are still in review. Um, some of them are still work in progress on my side. So uh, that's something we'll have to talk a bit later, like how we want to manage all of those uh, patches that are still in review. Can I, this is Dave Malcolm. Can I just say uh, thanks for your work, and I hope to get it all reviewed and into GCC for GCC 12. Okay, uh, good. Uh, I know this talk, yeah, but um, I'll, I'm sorry for being bad at review. No problem. Thank you. <laughs> um, so let's talk about the potential issues uh, that we um, might have to use this project in the real world. So um, there will be the problem of distributing the libgcc JIT shell library because uh, a particular GCC binary only targets like a specific architecture. It's not like LLVM that you can choose uh, at runtime to target whatever architecture you want. So that will mean we'll have a lot of those libraries to be actually built and distributed. So um, 
that's a problem we have to talk about. It also requires, as I mentioned earlier, a patch GCC currently. So uh, for the Rust uh, project, we want to like have a our own fork of GCC with those patches, uh, and like build it, like to actually build the libgcc JIT library. Um, that's again another project, another issue we'll have to talk about. Uh, and also, uh, some people mentioned that uh, there's some different ABI on some platforms. Like for instance, there's the architecture with uh, function pointers of 48 bits. So maybe that will require some work in the uh, Rust front end as well, like to add those particular uh, differences in the ABI. Also, some people mentioned that it will be nice to have the uh, target CLI argument to the Rust compiler that will just work. For instance, if you use a target that is not supported by LNVM, that will just uh, know about it and choose the GCC code gen as well. Um, so that would be pretty cool. Also, the folks from Rust for Linux mentioned that they might want to backport those patches to older GCC because their Linux kernel support uh, old GCC versions. So we'll have to investigate like if there will be any blockers for that. Uh, but yeah, they they wanted the support for that. Also, for uh, we, we might want to run the Rust test suite on those new architectures like under CI and maybe even Crater runs. So maybe set up some server or stuff to run those will be really helpful to uh, discover like bugs in the code gen or like finding some other issues. Uh, and also, uh, there, since we will add support for new architectures, uh, I was wondering like if we'll have any issues with the target triples. Like some of them are not in LLVM, I guess. Uh, so are they the same between GCC and LLVM? What about the mapping with the Rust ones? So that's uh, another issue that will be uh, helpful to talk about. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, now is the time. We'll also have uh, some time for discussion as well. Um, so perhaps I can go back like to this slide if some people are interested in talking about some specific issues here. Just a reminder to people to please feel free to turn their cameras on and um, unmute and start talking. We are getting some com a comment coming in on in the shared notes. Um, I don't know if you answered this one or not. Sorry, but for the bad code generation cases, do you plan to add, mm. do you plan to add new test cases to the rest test suites? Yeah, that was answered already. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. There's another one coming in. Um, you've worked uh, with the GCC and uh, libgcc JIT code bases now. How ingrained in the libgcc JIT um, is the assumption that one GCC supports only one target architecture? So uh, currently, uh, libgcc JT is a GCC front end. So I am not actually sure, like, how um, possible it would be to support more architectures, but perhaps uh, David Malcolm knows more about that. I'm not sure if David Malcolm is. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I hope you can hear me. Um, <laughs> Yeah, um, unfortunately, it's fairly deeply baked into the uh, implementation um, because it's basically libgcc JIT is a thin wrapper around GCC's code generation middle end. 
um, with a big mutex guarding all of that code. Um, a way it could, I can imagine a big refactoring where I, I, is the idea you want to be able to select different um, target architectures sort of at, well, I guess it's runtime for Rust C. Um, uh, I'm reading Josh's question. Yeah, I think that's the goal here, like to have something like LLVM where you can select at runtime the architecture you target. Uh, one way of doing that would be to basically add a, it would be a big refactoring, like a big one, is to add a level of indirection where the, um, you would, I guess, have multiple backend providers. Um, so what's currently built as libgcg lib GCC JIT, Dot so could basically become a plugin to what would then become the libgcc JIT. The header interface with all the entry points that Rust C would call into um, would would basically then call through that level of indirection and load a provider. That means you'd only have to be able to have one loaded at once, but you would at least be able to pick it dynamically. Maybe that's how we over engineering it. Um, how do you need to? have both in memory at once? Do you need to be able to switch? Um, my, yeah. my understanding is that it will be uh, selected like when the compiler starts and that will stay the same for the whole run of the compiler. Mm. Yeah. Um, because potentially, could you dynamically load LibGCCJIT and have just a, set them built for different architectures and pick which which one you dynamically link to based on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, currently that's like what is likely to be done, but I would, that would require building like a lot of, uh, of this library to support like all the architectures that we want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, G GCC, unfortunately, it's just the, the, the code generation is deeply baked in that there is a target. I don't, I think there's a, there was a multi-target thing, but I don't know. Maybe the GCC developers on the call can correct me. I don't know how well it works. But I think we de deeply have the assumption in the code that there is a specific target that has been configured, the code's configured and built for. Mm -hmm. I think some of the GCC properties are actually preprocessor macros inside GCC, and the GCC JIT might accidentally depend on those aspects. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, what I would expect from a packaging perspective that your existing install GCC already comes with a libgcc JIT version and you would just use that like kernel build would use the system GCC to build its stuff. But yeah. apparently that's not what you're aiming at. You you mean like there will be a libgcc build for all the, all the architectures that we want to support? <sighs> yeah, I mean, if you have a GCC uh, build for your target, then you expect it to basically also build libgccj for it, and the Rust compiler will then use that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I guess the, that's the simplest solution, and that's what will be used first. Uh, like, I guess the only issue is that we'll have to like build all of those libraries uh, for the distribution via Rust up or something. But yeah, that's. That's the simplest solution for now. OK, uh, thanks. I've got another question. Um, do you eventually expect to transition away from from the libgcc JIT library to something like an entry front end with a different sort of shim? like the ADA compiler, which is also written in ADA, does it? You, you are, uh, I'm not sure I understand. Are you asking if there will be like a uh, GCC Rust front end or? 
Yeah, regular front end in the GCC tree. Uh, so uh, that's not what I'm working on, but there's another project, uh, GCC RS, uh, which uh, will be talked about right after this talk, uh, which is a uh, Rust front end for GCC. So I encourage you to watch this talk. It's a it's a different project. Yeah, but it doesn't use the original Rust the reference implementation basically. Oh, okay. So that, that, that's I think that is a totally different approach. Okay, so you're uh, are you saying like the Ada front end uh, uses like some reference implementation and is implemented as a GCC front end in Ada to uh, generate Gimple? Yes, there's uh, the Ada front end is written in Ada, mm -hmm. uh, and there's a there's a some sort of handoff from the Ada side to the C side, and then um basically a bunch of C helpers that generate Gimple from what the Ada compiler generates as intermediate representation. Okay, I see. Um so the that would be really interesting. Uh but yeah that's not the goal of the project currently. Uh, so yeah it uses the libgccjt for simplicity. It might be, this is David Malcolm again, it might be worth mentioning though that your code is written in Rust, as I understand it. Mm -hmm. um, it's using the Rust bindings to libgcc JIT. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, which, I, which is cool. Um, so, the, you are, it's basically Rust code embedded inside the Rust compiler that's just calling through to libgcc JIT with, with a wrapper to, to express it in C terms. Yeah. Uh, I believe Florian was suggesting that it would still be implemented in Rust and somehow use the Rust front end and the GCC back end, but I am not knowledgeable enough to know how that will work. So in the chat, there was uh, Josh mentioning that poison values, uh, he believed that those were more motivated by the LLVM internals rather than Rust needs. So if that's not needed by GCC, uh, well, that might not be necessary for this project as well. So the, yeah, that will be nice to double check that and if that's the case, well, we won't have to do anything for that. He also mentioned in the chat, um, hey, Miguel. Hey, Anthony. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, <clears throat> one question about uh, binding and uh, Mixing DCC and Clang uh, mm -hmm. because as you know, uh, Bindgen uses libclang to part the C code. Mm -hmm. And the kernel, uh, we use it to generate the bindings for the C API. But then there is this question of if you build a, a kernel with DCC uh, and you are using Bindgen, which uses Clang internally, lib Clang, mm -hmm. then you may have a mismatch on the API. And I requested uh, the Bindgen folks, oh, perhaps we could have Bindgen uh, backend in DCC as well. So basically <laughs> the same question as in your, basically your work and the work of uh, Philippe as well, uh, et al, for the mm -hmm. other uh, front end is the same for Bindgen. Do you think you folks or other people may work on Bindgen? Do you have any uh, suggestion there on, on, on handling uh, bindings for projects that mix GCC and Clang, and that potentially, perhaps, use, for example, a plugin, a compiler plugin for GCC that changes, for example, the API. Or, yeah, thank you. Uh, that's a good question. I, I don't actually know the answer. Um, so yeah, I guess that will require some, as you mentioned, like some plugin to GCC to actually like read the header header files and generate the Rust code for that. Um, I wonder if David Malcolm has some idea about that. Thank you. Let's 
sorry, what was the question? I apologize. Um, so, this uh, was to do with ABI compatibility, right? So yeah, it was mentioned that they use BinGen, which uh, use libclang to read C header files to generate a, the equivalent Rust code so that like they can call the C code. So um, is there an equivalent in GCC? Because maybe there will be some ABI incompatibility mm -hmm. here. Um, I would hope that GCC and Clang would have compatibility, but um, but there may be bugs in libgcc Lib -GCC JIT. Um, I mean, libgcc JIT is basically attempting to generate the same code that sort of an equivalent C program would have written, but there may be bugs, um, and um, and again, there may be incompatibilities between GCC and LLVM. Um, and we probably should fix those. <laughs> I mean, it, it works in boot or normal in between post configuration, it works. And we can build, build, put the kernel, build with GCC, except for the Rust part, right? Uh, but the issue is that, for example, if you use a, a, a plugin for GCC that uh, you can configure in the kernel, that, for example, randomizes the track members, right, for security, then yeah, you, you see, or, or for example, even if there could be, it could be that uh, there is some if there in the kernel, in some header that depends on whether it's GCC or Clang. I don't think we have those, I don't think, but even if we don't have, uh, it would be nice at least to, to check, or at least even if it doesn't compile, it doesn't need to work ever in all single configuration, mm. in every single configuration, but at least it would be nice to check or have a way to, to verify that is the ABI is the same. Between yeah. Two. Well, one of, uh, there's a project called Lib Abigail that one of my colleagues at Red Hat works on, and that is, I believe, works off the dwarf debug data. Um, so it has a it has a bunch of tools for comparing, uh, basically capturing a more compact version of the ABI, and sort of comparing. You then you, and basically there's a comparison tool to see did you break ABI, um, and so that might be worth looking into. Uh, Doji Secatelli and and it's uh, Lip Abigail. Yeah, Nick, we actually discussed on, on last week on this. Uh, Nick suggested uh, Lip Abigail as well, so it looks like the house should go that route because we are not you suggested that. Uh, but yeah, more my question. My question to Anthony was more like uh, if there is going to be like within the Rust Lang organization, like an effort to get Bingen to work, Bingen or Bingen to work with uh, yeah with a GCC backend because that would solve also. Other, uh, other problems as well, like being able to not use Slim Clan but use GCC only. You may, I mean, basically, historically, GCC had there was this it is a big monolith, and thou shalt not, um, you know, the, to use it as individual modules, um, which unfortunately is bitterness rather. Um, and uh, the idea of being able to sort of take this just the C parser and scrape stuff out of it is hard, unfortunately. Um, well, at least, well, we don't need to, like, uh, there, there is, uh, I knew there was some options to, to dump the thing, but it probably is not stable. But at least what we could do, even if we don't have a parser, and we can use the parser independently, what we could do is have a way to query GCC. So GCC does the parsing, but then we have a way to query GCC, what is the ABI of this, and what, uh, what, how you have layout this in, the, in memory. So instead of being able to use, like, uh, we expose a new tool in GCC, in the toolchain, to do that only. Uh, that would be another way, instead of exposing the, as a library, the compiler. Yeah. Um, I suspect you could scrape the data you need out of the debug data and use some of the libabagail tools for that. That might be a reason, that probably be the... Yeah, this is exactly Nick, uh, that. Nick told me. Yeah, yeah, this is exactly, yeah. yeah. So, so in terms of what we have and what we need. I also say, Anthony, this is really cool, and thank you for your work. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's really, really nice to have a GCC back then. It's super nice to have it done so quickly. It was super surprising uh, how fast you, you made this work. Thank you. Yeah, um, there was also in the uh, shared notes, could you talk more about uh, what it will take to enable cross-language link time optimization between GCC compiled C code and Rust C code gen GCC compiled Rust code? Mm -hmm. uh, here again, I might need your help, David Malcolm. So uh, first, we'll 
uh, actually need to implement LTO for uh, this project as well. Uh, I, I'm not sure if like in GCC currently how that works. Do do you know if it supports cross-language LTO currently? In, I believe so. Uh, how it basically, um, the it saves a representation of the Gimpel SSA form into um, in a packed format inside the uh, the .dollo file, mm -hmm. and then at link time, um, it the a linker plugin is invoked, which calls the LTO one, which is effectively a new GCC a GCC front end that reads back in the packed um, Gimpel SSA from all the different um, uh, the .dollo files, and then um, depending on the strategy, it can try and optimize. It can sort of partition them into clumps if you've got a really really big um, uh, set of .dollo files, because obviously it can just be you can have this huge uh, graph of, of functions. Um, but in the simple case, it just it loads all the the, uh, the re reloads the Gimpel SSA that's already been somewhat optimized and has another go with them all in one big um, translation unit using the LTO one binary. Um, GCC libgcc JIT effectively also looks like a front end from the point of view of GCC, um, and I'm just sort of trying to think how on earth that would work. I think you I think you could set it up so it did write um, the GCC JIT. Uh, one thing that we haven't said is that the GCC JIT is the worst named library ever or, <laughs> or possibly because when I first wrote it I was looking at just in time compilation and I sort of added support for ahead of time compilations and afterthought and it seems that the Two projects who are most using it, both using it for ahead of time compilation <laughs> rather than just in time. So I kind of wish I could go back and change the name. Um, so I'm sorry about that. Um, but um, where was I going with that? Yeah, I think yeah, LibGC, the libgcc JIT in, would need to, as it's generating the .o file, would need to generate to basically to pack in that Gimbal SSA representation, which I think is. In theory, it's just as simple as injecting the right flag um, in um, jet playback dot C. Um, but I, and then um, and that would mean that the generated dot O file that was generated by libgcc jet would contain the 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 LTO bit code, as it were, um, and. And then, in theory, it could then be linked in with other .dot.o files, and whatever was invoking that link time optimized link would need to tell it to and do link time optimization, right? Mm. So, in theory, that would work. And in theory, it's a one-line change to <laughs> to JIT playback .dot.c. But I'm, um, you know, I, I, uh, theory theory and practice are uh, the same in theory, but they're not in practice, as the joke goes. So um, yeah, no, no, no. Um, sounds like an interesting thing to try out. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. Um, yeah, if you want to ping me, if you want to play with that, or we can <laughs> try that out. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have an IRC channel for the project? By the way, I'm on the 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 other project's IRC channel, <laughs> like Philips. Channel, I, so if you do that, I do not have one, but I can create one. Uh, yeah, well, I don't know if that's how you work. Oh, uh, yeah. Yep. So, uh, related to that, I'm not too familiar with ThinLTO, but I believe it's a LLVM. It's implemented in LLVM. So, uh, do anybody knows if that's something that is also implemented in GCC or how, how that works? I don't think so, uh, but I'm not an expert on the GCC LTO implementation. Uh, hopefully, someone can correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. Uh, basically, I think it's a sort of there's you either ha it's basically a boolean. You either are storing LTO or you're not in the .dollo file. And so, as I understand, the LLVM thin LTO is basically it's a it's it's a sort of cheaper version of it. Or, but, but again, I'm even less knowledgeable about LLVM's LTO than I am about. <laughs> GCCs, sorry. No problem.
So there were some discussions in the chat. I'll read that to see if there's any questions. Okay, so there was a question. Uh, is there something in LLVM that predicates undefined result? Is that poison or something else? Does GCC need something to propagate an undefined result around to? Uh, yeah, poison values are something that uh, propagates uh, undefined behavior. Uh, I'm not sure if there is any other things in LLVM as well. and. Uh, for GCC, that's something I don't know. Uh, David, Malcolm, do you happen to know if there's something equivalent in GCC? Uh, sorry, I get um, uh, uh, propagating undefined information inside the compiler. I don't think GCC is that. I don't know enough about LLVM's implementation to really answer that. I'm afraid. Sorry. Okay. Uh, sorry. Um, well, I'm not seeing any more questions coming in. Okay. Uh, are you seeing any more coming in? Uh, one of the channels. No, I think we've gotten all the questions. So uh, I, think I, think, I think there was another one um, yeah. by Josh. Would it be possible to have a GCC option to print the path to the corresponding libgcc or vice versa, a libgcc JIT function to print the path to the corresponding GCC C compiler binary? That would be really convenient for finding one from the other when wanting to compile both C and Rust code. Um, let's see. I, I don't, I don't think there is uh, any such function currently, but that's probably something we can add. I wonder though, if we were thinking about having multiple libgccg.sos, so one per target, would that, oh, I, I guess we would know which, um, which target that the, the regular GCC was compiled with, so that that could still work, yeah. Um, but uh, I think the basic idea is implementable, but I, I wonder about those sort of weird cases like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the those libraries will end up in some on uh, Linux in something like user lib the architecture slash. Uh, yeah. So I guess that should work. Yeah, the the compiler has a concept of the sort of the path, the installation path to which it knows all its bits are installed to, um, and um, which uh, so. But yeah, as you say, it would actually be a slight. I think it would be a slightly different place because it's a library and not a not part of GCC proper. Yeah, yeah. so not sure. Sorry. Mm 